video and I just want to take a little bit and do like a couple week series about how to get started with Cucumber and testing and all that fun jazz. Right now there's a lot of um, need for people who are doing QA to learn this and um, not a lot of people filling the spot. So every week in my inbox I've got uh, requests being like, hey, can you send me some Cucumber people? And I have to say, no, I can't because they're all busy and happy somewhere. Um, so what is this stuff? Well, um, you see, we've called this cucumber, capybara, poltergeist, and some other weird words you may not care about right now, but, um, it's a set of tools that lets you automate browser testing and, uh, of, of websites and automate pretty much anything actually, um, for, for a lot of good reasons. So let's kind of see what's up here. So there's this whole reason that we test things and we want to make sure that we don't give customers something that's broken uh, when it's when they expect you know not to have broken stuff they're paying you for so even though there's tests built into big applications to make sure that things these things work and don't get sent out broken it's kind of handy to have around a set of tests that make sure that things are working as intended from like your your business perspective it used to be that when you did that sort of thing, you had to have this big old binder of like manual steps to go through and it was really boring and tedious and it would take you weeks to actually ship a product. So what Cucumber and all its friends let us do is kind of automate all that and let us run it very quickly so we can ship faster and more often and make sure that things are working. Um, you know, it's pretty kind of clear why you would do that, right? If you don't get why you would not want to have a binder of stuff. Um, well, maybe you should go watch something else. But there's some other advantages you get from that. And that's when you automate your tests, you can kind of like reuse parts that you've done before. So when you can eventually end up uh, just being faster and more productive at, at testing. And as well, that you know, you, you've got this um, way of moving forward that uh, lets developers kind of be happy and, and, and that sort of thing. And more on that later. Um, you know, it lets us really test any given scenario, whether you're trying to like fill out a form or you want to make sure a button is purple when it's supposed to be or whatever. So out of all the tools that are out there, just Cucumber is one of them. And that's the one we're going to learn and we're going to go through here. And there's a version of Cucumber that run on like any computer in any programming language. But we're going to focus on the variant in the Ruby language. Why? Well, let's take a look. So, can you figure this out? If you're a programmer, maybe you can. If you're not, it should make a little bit of sense. Um, there's some symbols and things on there and some punctuation that's kind of odd. Um, but this is actually code that works. And what we can kind of assume here is that there's a button called something that we're going to click. And what this says is that we're going to actually click a button called arg1. We can name it something friendly, we can name it whatever, but I mean, if you've ever seen other kinds of code before, there's all this weird stuff that goes in there to set up your environment and whatnot. And Ruby's just really plain English. Ruby um, was designed by its author to be a language that makes programmers happy. And I think it can really just kind of make everyone happy when they're using it. So what's Cucumber? It's a testing framework that's just driven by plain English text, just sentences, nouns, verbs, other things like that. You know, things we use to communicate with each other so we don't sound like cavemen. Um, so this text that we write it serves as documentation to say, oh, this is how it's supposed to work. It actually is the automated test itself, and it's a development. It uh, just kind of like all in the same package to say, if you write your test first, that you can eventually write your code so it matches the test. So that's why it'd be a development aid. So Cucumber itself doesn't do much. It's just like this plain English thing. You need other software to um, kind of drive it and make it work. So we're going to be using, later on in the series, uh, software called Selenium, Capybara, and something called uh, Poltergeist. I think we're going to be using Firefox and some other tools as well. So what that's going to do is the Cucumber, plus all these things, will like open up a browser, um, navigate to where you need it to go. It'll click the right things. It'll test the right things. So don't really worry about, like that sounds kind of complex if you're not used to this. It's really, really easy. 
So what's up next? The basic unit of cucumber testing is the feature or a scenario. And every scenario follows a particular structure. It's as given something, when something happens, then I expect this. So let's explore like just the concepts here. There's no more need to worry about code or any details yet. So we always start with a given. A given sets the machine up or sets the test up to be in a state where we know where it's okay. So it gets you to the starting line. Like, okay, this is where I need to be. Let's start testing. So in the given step, we'll say, uh, given I'm a user, simple enough, right? Given I'm a user and I'm on the homepage, Okay, that's just setting yourself up to start your tests. When is the next step? So given I've done something, when is going to be the next step? When is the thing that is your testable outcome? It's the, it's the thing that you're actually testing. So we already talked about given. Given I'm on the home page. When I fill in a form or when I click a button. Okay, then next. Probably got this so far. Then. And this is the thing that the, the outcome that you're actually observing. Given I'm on the home page, when I click this button, then I should see this. And this is when you're going to say, well, this is where my test either fails or succeeds. Um, and really, you're going to test for, you're going to find yourself testing for two sort of scenarios. This is one that I should expect this to happen. Um, but very often, too, you'll find that, like, I should not expect for this terrible thing to happen. Right? So that's basically it, given, when, and then. So how do we, like, glue all this together, right? We do so with a text file, which is plain text. It says this is our feature file. And we describe our feature. Here it's login uh, from the home page. We just want to make sure that we can go to a website and uh, click the login button and we should see something uh, on, the, on the page that we expect. So here, pretty easy. Um, we have a background step here. We'll talk more about that later. Um, the background. You can actually just, if, if you really need to think about it, the given could sit right above the when. So given I am on the homepage, when I click login, then I should see catering, see the title catering. And the framework that we're using is smart enough to say that it knows what a web page title is, right? You don't have to say, be very explicit about that. So how does that all work? Well, you write the plain English, and then there's some pretty easy Ruby that sits behind it. And, like, really don't be all too intimidated about it because, like, anybody can really do it. Once you get a handle on, like, the sort of semantics and whatnot, you really even de don't need to be a Ruby programmer. You just kind of need to know um, how the things fit together. So the feature file goes to the step file and says, well, how do I execute the things that I've been told to do? And that's when we say, we define what the givens, the whens, and the thens, and, and what they do. So here we've got, um, you know, given I go here, when I click this, this happens. And this is just the Ruby code. You can, it's pretty easy to see. Um, the last one that's kind of important there is the then, which is the assertion that we're making. It's saying, I expect the page to have the title title. Um, so don't worry about it right now. Like I said, um, the next part will really kind of dig down into that. So once we have a feature and a step file, we can actually run the Cucumber program itself. This is an example of what the output looks like. These tests have passed. They're all green. And, well, it says it passed. Uh, if it failed, you'd, it'd be red. And you'd get usually a message that would tell you um, why it didn't pass. Like, I expected this one thing, but I didn't see it, so hey, go and fix that. As a QA person, it's not really your duty to, like, figure out what's broken in the code, but to at least warn someone as to where it broke, right? So what actually happened when I ran this? In this case, it opened a set of browsers on a website called browserstack.com, or a service that lets you remotely test lots of different browsers. And it ran these tests with very little configuration on my part um, across multiple web browsers. So it tested it on, on Internet Explorer and some other browsers uh, to make sure that the behavior was consistent amongst all of them. So you don't really need that. You can actually get started locally. 
Um, you might use Firefox or uh, a headless browser, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Um, but a headless browser, browser is a browser that doesn't require a user interface. So it runs, you don't see it, it's happening, it's doing stuff, but you don't see it, right? So the best thing about that is that that can run on a remote server where like your entire team can see the results of what happened. They don't actually need, the browser doesn't need to be visible because it's a server that no one's looking at, but the output is, is very handy to have on something that's remote. So, but you still can see it. So as I said, I ran this on browser stack. So when we use a service like browser stack, we can specify, hey, can you take a picture of each of these steps? And we can do this locally too. You can do this on your own machine or on a group machine that you use for testing. You know, just in case you kind of want the visual record. Um, we can, you know, keep in mind that the point of Cucumber and its friends there is that you don't actually need to look at this. Um, you should trust its output when it says your tests are green uh, because it's actually running all of those tests in a web browser. It's just driving it and kind of programming it with the language that you speak. So while it's handy, you know, try to trust the output. So I didn't really talk about a whole lot, but I just wanted to get everyone sort of familiar with some basic concepts. Next week, we're going to talk about how you get set up with the tools you need to run Cucumber with Ruby. We're going to write a feature we're against Google, and we're going to write um, some steps to go behind that feature, and then we're actually going to run it. And uh, I, I believe that like the first time you see it, there's a little bit of magic when you see like your web browser pop up and actually run your tests, and it's like, hey, I did that. So hopefully uh, next week, if you stick around, we'll get to that. It, I promise you again that it's not difficult, it's not hard, but it's uh, something worth knowing. So thanks again.